Paulo Figueiredo is the grandson of a former president of Brazil and was Brazil's most popular journalist until the Brazilian Supreme Court declared his reporting misinformation and canceled his passport, froze his bank accounts, and suspended his social media. He says that leftist ideology, anti-Americanism, and Iran and China's growing influence inside Brazil are a threat to the entire Western world. This is a warning that Americans need to start paying attention to what is happening in South America before it's too late. I think when most Americans think about Brazil, they think about soccer, amazing food, meat, uh, and probably the carnival. But now we're starting to think about Brazil as political turmoil and some danger emerging even towards the United States. So I wanted to bring you in to talk to you about what is happening in this huge partnering nation of ours and what should Americans know and contemplate as things are changing in that region? Tell us a little bit about your background. Your grandpa was obviously quite famous, um, and it's pretty amazing to hear that somebody who is the grandson of a former president of Brazil now doesn't feel safe living in Brazil, but chooses to live here in the United States of America. Thanks for having me. Yes, I come from a family that's very traditional in Brazil, a patriot. Uh, my my great grandfather was the general that fought against Getulio Vargas, which was the dictator of Brazil. He, he started a revolution against the fascist dictator, and he lost. And he was a political prisoner for years. That, that was in the 30s. Many years later, in the 80s, his his son became the president. He was the last military, the last general that. Um, was the president of Brazil. He was the one that made the transition from the military government towards full civilian democracy. And a lot of it was because he was persecuted. Uh, his father was persecuted. So he was a son of a political, almost refugee. It, it's bad that Brazil, it, you used to think of all, all, about all these good things about Brazil, and now you think about what's going on. And I think what we're facing now are the same challenges that the United States and most of the Western world are facing but just with institutions that are not as strong. And, and so we're facing it in a harder way. I want to get to know a little bit about your, your, your family and you more. Do you remember your grandpa? Oh, and yeah. did you have a relationship with him? Very close, yeah. What did he stand for? Was he conservative? Was he, he on was the very left? Conservative. He was. He was very conservative uh, with all the conservative values. And uh, yeah, he, he died when I was 17. So uh, the f <laughs> So he died when I joined, when I, when I got into a journalism school and he hated journalists for a good reason. Uh, although the press wasn't as bad uh, mm -hmm. back, back in his time as it is right now. But <laughs> the last thing was uh, him being disappointed <laughs> that I was becoming a journalist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he was very influential in my life. Tell me a little bit about the history of what has been happening recently in Brazil. Why is it my impression that there is complete political turmoil? Describe a little bit what happened with Bolsonaro and Lula mm -hmm. and um, this very visible corruption. Sure. Uh, so uh, it was interesting because after my grandfather left office, all the civilians that came after him were from a type of some flavor of the left. They were all leftists. So you had in the beginning, Sarney, and then you have Fr Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who was the president in, in the mid-90s until early 2000s uh, for two terms. Very, it was George Soros guy, guy in Brazil, the professor of Sorbonne, very, uh, I would say, the sophisticated European left. And then you had Lula, which was always, since, since the 80s, my grandfather actually arrested Lula um, in the 80s. He was a union leader and very Marxist, very Stalinist in a way, uh, old, raw communism, you know, um, very nationalist, which is interesting. And, but Lula, when in 2002, Lula hired uh, a marketing expert uh, that changed him completely. He started wearing nice suits, drinking sophisticated wines, and he signaled to the establishment that he would be more moderate. 
And that's how he got elected. And he, he was elected and he was extremely popular because at, in, at the same time, he fulfilled everything that the this establishment, more sophisticated left wanted. But also he was very populist in the sense that he started very successful programs and and Brazil was facing a good moment in the economy because of the the, the way that the world was set up. When was that? And that was uh, early 2000s. From 2003, the Lula took office in 2003, and then he left in 2012. So would you say that his first term, he was you know, pretty popular and generally successful? very popular, very popular. Well, remember, Brazil is a commodity producer, and that was the time that China was booming. So China desperately needed Brazilian commodities. And, and so because of that, Brazil had a lot of money. And instead of using that money to pay the debt and, or invest in infrastructure, they used to create a big government with a big social welfare program. And, and that was electorally very successful. So Lula made his successor, which was a lady called Dilma Rousseff. She's now the president of the BRICS bank. Mm. Um, and she, she did one term and then the economy started paying the price for the policies that Lula, Lula started because they started spending so much. And once the world economy was not doing so well, the Brazilian government ran out of money. Also, the corruption reached levels that was unimaginable. So the whole purpose of the Brazilian government at one point, all the Brazilian public companies, the Brazilian government was to generate money for the Socialist Workers' Party in Brazil. And we're talking about billions and billions to the point that the Operation Car Wash started uh, investigating what was going on. So in, in I'm talking about 2014 to 2015, Operation Car Wash started investigating corruption and at, at the same time, Dilma was facing political problems because the economy was doing very badly. Brazil was in the worst economical crisis in its history because once she couldn't um, buy out all the politicians to support her, she started losing support. So she ended up being impeached in 2015. Can you explain what is Operation Car Wash and how is President Lula connected to it? Sure. Operation Car Wash started as a small operation investigating um, some dollar deals in the south of Brazil. But then it became a huge thing because uh, they used a, a very interesting method inspired in what happened with the, the clean hands operation in Italy. Uh, so they started uh, getting people, arresting them and making deals like the prosecution making deals with them so they would appoint other people that were involved and then they would arrest these other people that would appoint the people that were involved in the top and and he went all the way to arresting uh, Lula for corruption he was actually um convicted in Bra Brazil has a weird system uh with four tiers <laughs> okay. uh, it's not like the US you have the the, the first degree court and they have that appeals court and Brazil has four degrees uh so Lula was convicted all the way to the third degree um, by a panel of judges twice for who corruption. Who are these people who came after Lula and convicted him? Who are these people and why did they come after him? It's interesting because these people are mostly from the establishment. This is why I don't understand. Yes, they're from the establishment, uh, but they're from the... Oh, remember I told you about the, like, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, the, the other flavor of the left, uh, more globalists, more educated, and they were tired with the corruption and inefficiency of the Lula government. And so they decided, well, it's time for us to go back to what we had with Fernando Henrique. So uh, not exactly that, but a flavor of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't say they only had bad motiv motivations. I think maybe they, they had a sense of this country is going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in this process, they disrespected the due process of law completely. At one point, they were doing illegal wiretaps. They were uh, torturing mentally and in con some cases, po possibly physically, the prosecutors, people, uh, and they used methods that, that were just bad. Lula, for example, I think it's my opinion. A lot of people disagree with me, but I, I don't think he was properly convicted. I, I think 
the Supreme Court found an excuse to take him out of prison so he could run for office. To the point that from a legal perspective, I understand that the argument that they made was correct, that Sergio Moro was not the correct judge to try Lula. What was he convicted for? He was convicted for corruption. He uh, he got money from uh, construction companies in Brazil. While he was president. While he, while he was president, yes. And so they basically took him out. He was sent to jail. But then they said that the process that they sent him to jail through was actually flawed. And they pulled him out of jail, cleaned his record, and had him run for president again. Is that right? That, that is correct. What happened was that, um, so the, the left, the, the establishment got rid of Lula. They got rid of Lula because they said, we want to go back to the, the way things were with the other flavor of the left. So the problem was the world was not the same. With social media and this national populist movement, uh, people were speaking. The media lost the monopoly of of the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, the spiral of silence was broken. I like the way that Andrew Claven says Donald Trump was the Godzilla of uh, of the crazy experiments that the left made, and the monster, the Godzilla came up. Bolsonaro was the Godzilla from Brazil. The, no one ever expected that he was going to win. And he won. And we had the, these guys that got rid of Lula, they were like, oh, this is not what we wanted. Hmm. So at one point, the same people, I'm talking about the mainstream media, the judicial system, the prosecutors, the established in the financial market, the same people that got rid of Lula tried to find someone that could defeat Bolsonaro because, whoa, this is way worse. This is way worse than what we had. So who can defeat Bolsonaro? So they tried the third way. That's all they called it. So they, so they, they tried several third way candidates. That was not Bolsonaro and not Lula. But the problem is none of them have votes. Um, so they had to find a way to reestablish Lula as a candidate. And Lula brought a vice president that's from that same faction, globalist faction from the left, was the former governor of Sao Paulo, who was his, his, it ran against him in 2014, I believe, or 2010, but now he's the vice president. So the guy that ran against Lula, representing the more right, is now Lula's vice president. That's how big the establishment is in Brazil. So they rehabilitated Lula, and the same media that used to call him a crook started saying that he had clean records. The same Supreme Court justices that badmouthed him said he, he had a perfect record and now he, they're now his friends. So that's that's what happened. And then he, he got back in power with an election that was, uh, that favored him, the, the whole process in so many ways I couldn't describe. What was told to Brazilian citizens who knew that Lula was first sent to jail? How were they convinced that, did they say, oh, this was a huge mistake or there was corruption? Did they throw someone under the bus? Like, how do you take somebody from being a villain to being the next president? Is it just constant media brainwashing? Like, how did they do that? The media matters way more in Brazil than it does here. It's way more influential in Brazil than it is here, the mainstream media. Hmm. Here in the U.S., I think the process of them losing the credibility completely is... It's almost done. No one trusts the media, and, and the polls show that, right? So the media has a lot of importance in Brazil, and uh, they openly campaigned for Lula. That was one side. The other side is that the Supreme Court um, bluntly censored anyone that said anything bad about Lula. That sounds actually familiar. Yeah. Uh, I was telling you, uh, I think Brazil and the U.S., they have the same virus, and the virus comes from the United States. I, I, I joke that the American universities are the one lab. They of come bad up ideas. with the, uh, bad ideas. They come up with the virus. Uh, but in Brazil, for example, instead of having the uh, FBI telling people from Twitter that they shouldn't publish a story or Mark Zuckerberg because it's Russian disinformation, in Brazil was not like that. In Brazil, I was on TV on the number one political show on primetime, and I used to have orders saying the Supreme Court decided, the Supreme Electoral Court, Superior Electoral Court decided that you can't talk about this. 
For, for example, this is a real thing. I couldn't say on air that Lula was unconvicted of corruption mm-hmm. because he was never found not guilty. He was he was convicted and he was unconvicted. So we used to play with that language. But then the Superior Electoral Court decided, although that was true, we couldn't say it because it was going to mislead the public. You had a massive media presence in Brazil, which they took away from you. It, was that basically the consequence of you speaking out against the regime? I mean, what what was the consequence for saying the things that you were not allowed to say? Well, I was doing the number one show, the number one political show in the country on primetime. And uh, we had more viewers than CNN and Globo and all other stations combined times two. Like what are those numbers? Uh, two million people watching the, my show every day. So yeah. it's similar Huge. to like Tucker Carlson mm-hmm. used to have here in the United States. So the, the, this was the show. And in during the elections, I started dealing with a lot of censorship coming from decisions in the court. And they said that was temporary. That was just to guarantee the election integrity. Sounds familiar? So it was just temporary, but they would reestablish after elections all the freedoms. So after elections, it didn't happen at all because we started questioning the process of election and the transparency of the process. In Brazil, the courts decided we couldn't talk about it. In the U.S., the media said, well, it's the big lie. Uh, We shouldn't talk about it. Uh, It's bad and all that. But in Brazil, it was not like that at all. You couldn't. So, for example, on December 30th, of 2022, actually, um, the court decided that they canceled my Brazilian passport. They froze all my bank accounts and assets in Brazil. They blocked my social media, which uh, only my Twitter had 1.4 million followers. My YouTube channel has 1.1 million followers. And uh, they also issued a fine for every time I said any fake news, although there's no legal definition of what is a fake news. And I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that I've never said anything fake in my life in, on air. In the f- next following two weeks, the Department of Justice opened an investigation against my the TV station that I worked for and threatened them to cancel their concession. In Brazil, TVs are public concessions. So they had to fire all the conservative commentators, all of them. And it was not only me. And this is all on the grounds of fake news. They claim that you provide misinformation. And then who is the they? This is the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court. Well, Alexandre de Moraes is the, right now, the de facto dictator of Brazil. It's the Supreme Court justice. The justice. So the Supreme Court in Brazil has more power than the president. The more power than anybody. Way more. And they brag about it. Recently, they they had this little clash with the Senate, and they openly said on air that we brought Lula to power, so we deserve some credit. The app, one, one of the Supreme Court justices, and I'm quoting him literally, he went to a student um, meeting dominated by the left, and he went on stage. I'm talking about Supreme Court justice, and he bragged about it. He said, we defeated Bolsonarism, which is like Trumpism, yeah. Bolsonarism. It's like, we defeated, we, they brag about it. <laughs> uh, they say that by doing that, they saved the Brazilian democracy. So it was all in the name of democracy. Does that sound familiar? Well, it sounds familiar, only a way worse nightmare, because it sounds like the Supreme Court controls all the media and basically tells what what is allowed to be shared and what isn't allowed to be shared. And if they don't like it, they'll just take you out. So, Well, the, most of the mainstream media agrees with them. They don't have to, to control them right. because it's the same ideology. Got they it. also agree that I need to be censored. So let's talk about Bolsonaro for for a minute. So sitting here in the United States, I heard the worst things about President Bolsonaro. You know, he allowed people to die under COVID. There was a lot of, you know, a lot of news came our way. Uh, In preparation for our conversation, I went online um, and I was looking for podcasts that can explain to me what is happening in Brazil right now. And virtually every single one of these podcasts that I would stumble upon would say something like, Thank God Lula is back, a victory for democracy, as in, thank God we got rid of Bolsonaro. And so 
I, I am wondering, what is the truth about Bolsonaro? Can we even have access to it? Was he so horrible or did the media do to him what the media has done to Trump? It's the exact same phenomenon uh, with the difference that the United States has a more prominent conservative media and Brazil has none. Mm. So anything you read about Bolsonaro in the newspapers is, is garbage. And it's weird because I criticize Bolsonaro for a lot of things and they call me a Bolsonarist. And I was like, no, it's, I defend him because everyone is so unfair to him that I have to step up and defend him most of the times from lies. But I don't agree with all his policies. We have very a lot of differences in the way, especially in terms of strategy for the country. But the media, is, they lie so much. What they've done with Donald Trump and with Bolsonaro, it's unprecedented in the history of journalists. Because the media was always biased. It was biased in the time of my grandfather. And he used to complain a lot about it. When you look at the numbers now, it's not like there's a difference of 10% in the good coverage versus bad coverage. No, it's not. Now, if you look at Trump's numbers, is 5% of good coverage and 70% of bad coverage and the rest in the middle. This, this, that never happened in the history of, the, of journalism. And that's exactly what's happening with Bolsonaro. So Bolsonaro's ideas, he didn't control policy for COVID because the Supreme Court of Brazil decided that the states had the power to decide their policies. Mm. Although the Constitution in Brazil doesn't say so like it does in the U.S. But the Supreme Court stepped in and decided, no, the governors are going to have the power to decide the policy. So Bolsonaro never implemented the policies that he wanted, most of them. But if he, if he would, it, they would be very similar to what Ron DeSantis did in Florida. And I say that because I live in Florida, so I know for a fact. And I, I think Everyone in the country now agrees that Florida did the way, except your governor, Gavin Newsom. <laughs> I believe everyone else agrees that Florida did way better than most states in, in the United States. What are things that people were happy with Bolsonaro when he was uh, president over there? Obviously not the left, but, you know, people like you. On top of the media being very dishonest with uh, about Bolsonaro, he was not great in the way he dealt with the press. Mm -hmm. Some... Uh, some phrases, some quotes were unfortunate. It's like, um, and and um, and people got tired of it. A lot of people got tired of it, as as they did with Donald Trump. Mm. Here, people would complain about Donald Trump's tweets. In Brazil, was more Bolsonaro giving interviews. But what about his actions? I mean, here I think people were very upset with the way Donald Trump tweeted or spoke, but they were pretty happy with you know his policies. Well, it's the same with Brazil. Bolsonaro left the country with the country growing, uh, with uh, the 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 public uh, accounts at Treasury he was doing fantastic, better than he did in, in many many years. Unemployment was going down. Brazil had a uh, in in the in the pandemics in 2020 and 2021 and 2022. Brazil did actually way better than most countries. Mm. Uh, Bolsonaro stepped in with a program to save companies and to create a base income for people that was. Um, th they were staying at home, and people liked that a lot. I think what people liked about like Bolsonaro is that he's authentic. I met him like Donald Trump. I met him a lot in person. I met him. I know how he is uh, on TV. He, he's the same person. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Bolsonaro. They're very different among themselves. Mm -hmm. But Bolsonaro, I know him personally fairly well. He's the same guy that you see on TV, and it's, I, I, I think people sense that authenticity. Uh, also, he shared the values of the majority of Brazilian population. Brazil is a, the, the population in Brazil is conservative in values. We're a Christian country. Mm. We're more Christian than America. We're uh, in the percentage of population. We're majority of the population is against abortion. Majority of the population is against uh, any any type of legalization or liberation of drugs. Majority of the population in Brazil believes in the family, uh, the biblical family. Mm. So it's a, it's a, and Bolsonaro followed all that. And I think a lot of people like that. Where is Bolsonaro living now? Has he been chased out of the country as well? No, he's living in, he tried, he came to the United States and he spent four months here. And uh, Senator Bob Menendez, who's now on the news, he, uh, he, he, I think he passed a resolution in the U.S. Senate 
uh, asking that he would be extradited or something like that. But he, they threatened him of being extradited to Brazil, although he wasn't being uh, sought for any crimes. But he went back to Brazil and he lost all his, his political rights. In four months, they decided that he could not run for office anymore. So they and they opened. He's like, I don't I don't even know how many indictments against him he's facing. But this again, the same thing as they did to Donald Trump. Right. But a lot stronger because the immune system of Brazil is, is worse. So I, I believe if they could uh, make Donald Trump lose his political rights and become an electable, they would. And they did that with Tujai Bolsonaro like that. And Alexandre Moraes was the lead guy behind that. You know, it's amazing as you describe this power of the Supreme Court in Brazil, uh, where you have a dictator who gets to control the institutions, gets to control the media, the news, uh, gets to control who gets to even run for re-election. You know, it really begs the, the question of can Brazil, there, there's effectively no freedom. There's no political freedom. And that's what faces the country now the most. People are just, they lost their hopes. And what I think the Millet's election in Argentina, mm. that shows hope. That shows we can defeat the establishment. They're not indestructible. Argentina did it. And the United States, I believe, will do it. And I think we can do that in Brazil as well. And a lot of that has been done by journalists like myself who are in the United States, and we can still speak freely because of, thank God, First Amendment. Right. Well, you talk about the power that the courts have, and I, I want to focus on that for a minute, because I remember going to college here in the United States thinking, well, the courts will solve the issues, right? Like, we'll, we'll go to court, we'll get a fair trial. And now you're seeing the left trying to pack the courts in the United States. You're seeing places around the world, and you can bring up Israel. They almost went into a civil war over giving more power to the courts or taking away power from the courts. Um, and, and so Brazil is this example where the courts have so much power. I don't know if there are term limits on the Brazilian Supreme Court, but you have somebody who is not an elected official who has this kind of power, plus you can't get rid of them. I, I think it's a, it's a stark warning to the rest of the world that you may think that you're living in a democracy where you can, you know, vote for an elected official. But if the Supreme Court is in a place where they can control everything, you don't really quite have the right to vote for anybody in particular? Not only the Supreme Court, but all the courts. I think the of the virus that I think the American universities are exporting, the juristocracy virus is one of the worst. Mm. The transformation from the democracy, the government from the people, to the government from the juris, juristocracy, from the, the, the non-elected bureaucrats. Yes. And that's what's been going on. It's the same virus. Uh, but in Brazil, we have the Supreme Court that is all powerful. In, in the U.S., the, US the, the Supreme Court only looks at 100, uh, around 100 uh, constitutional cases. In Brazil, the Supreme Court has a right to look at any case. Mm. There's no, uh, they don't have to confer certs to, uh, to any case. You can't, you will, any case, any issue can be heard by the Supreme Court. Mm. So they step in on every subject. Wherever they want. And it's even worse because right now, most of the probes that are investigating the right in Brazil which is supposedly the one that I'm, I'm being uh, investigated under, they were created by the Supreme Court. There's no Department of Justice. The Supreme Court, they say they are the victims. They open that because they say, well, people were spreading fake, fake news about the Supreme Court, so they're the victims. Okay. They're also the judges because they're overlooking all this and they're going to try all this. And also, they are the investigators and the accusators. So they're doing all the roles. So, so the accusatory system, which is a bad work of the Western world uh, legal system, it's it's gone in Brazil. That's they're doing all that themselves. And they decided that that they could, the Constitution s clearly says they can't do it, but they decided they can. And who are supposed to say what the Constitution Right, determines? they get to interpret it too. Yes, they get to interpret it. That's unbelievable. And I think that part of that's because we all imported the system, the great system that the American founding fathers imagined, but they never thought that this way of interpreting the laws, this living constitution, this social justice interpretation, they never imagined that this would exist. And that's why every country in the world is facing a problem with their judicial system. The establishment noticed that they can, well, they can circumvent 
the democracy, the process, the let's, let's say you want abortion, okay? Well, one way is, well, you pass in a bill and, and, and turn into a law, you, the Congress, the House has to approve, then it goes to the Senate, and then the president has to sign up. And, and then, well, you need all this discussion. If it's, if it's in a constitutional amendment, you have to be ratified by the states. This is a nightmare. It takes a lot of time. You need to have control of a lot of the moving parts. Mm. And that's exactly what the founding fathers of this country wanted. But the elites notice that they can circumvent all that and with a bunch of judges, they can decide pro-abortion. This is exactly what happened in the United States in Roe v. Wade. And, and this is a great way of avoiding going through the system. Hmm. And that's the problem the whole world is facing right now. You mentioned the United States exporting bad ideas. And, you know, as a mom, one of the worst Goods ideas. Goods as well. Yes. Uh, but, but as a mom, one of the things that really worries me that we're exporting here from the United States is this whole transgenderism movement, but coupled with intersectionality and DEI, is that something that you're seeing in Brazil as well? Yes. It spreads through the media and through Hollywood mostly mm. and the academia as well. Mm. So you immediately see subjects that are not even familiar to Brazil being spoken. So for example, someone got on the street and in and, and the main uh, street of main avenue of Sao Paulo and wrote Black Lives Matter. And that doesn't make any sense in Brazil, but Brazil never had segregation. Brazil never had any racial issues. Everyone is integrated. We're, we're all, we don't, don't even actually have races, but they start repeating the same things that they hear from the United mm -hmm. States. So, and the same thing with uh, transgenderism. There was, the Brazilian culture is so against that. And you see that though, because all Latin cultures are against that. The, the, the Latinos come to the United States and the Democrats are being crushed in some states because of their crazy woke policies, including that. And still, the media talks about that all the time. We now have a transgender congressman, uh, the, the, the Global, which are the novellas, our Hollywood, talks about it all the time. So it's a subject that's so weird for the general public. Mm -hmm. But for the elites, it's a, a, a way of signal virtue. Is this, is this associated with the left in Brazil as well as yeah. it is here? Yeah, so it's, of a, it's It's a leftist kind of mentality. Yeah, the, the right The, the right breakdown things. of the family and, and the upside down world. Which is part of their plan. Yeah. Uh, globally speaking. Right. Well, speaking of globally, I want to bring up BRICS. Sure. Uh, because I think this is where it becomes quite concerning for Americans. So maybe you can explain BRICS a little bit and also what's imminent January 2024. The BRICS nations have invited additional nations to join. Iran is one of the countries that might be joining BRICS. And then my understanding is Argentina is rejecting the invitation because they're probably siding with the United States and the West with, with Javier Malay. But give, give a little bit of background uh, about BRICS and its significance in the world. What I think is interesting is that uh, the Financial Times published, published an article earlier uh, in 2023 saying that uh, they're bragging about how the U.S. government and the Department of State meddled with Brazilian elections to guarantee that Lula was elected. Uh, and it was very weird. They said, even the CIA putting, pre this is the Financial Times, not some crazy uh, conspiracy theory, uh, saying how much the United States wanted Lula to become president, the Biden administration. And I, I always, it puzzled me, and I've been asking this question around in the United States a lot. Did they do that because they're stupid or did they do that because they hate America? And I, I've been getting mixed answers. No one knows. But the fact is that one, once Lula got elected, he immediately started anti-American policies. Bolsonaro was the most pro-United States president we had since my grandfather, who was a personal friend of Ronald Reagan. Uh, Bolsonaro was the next one that was pro-United States. All the left in Brazil hates America. And it's a, it's, it's a very Latin America thing. The anti-imperialists, that's all they call. You see the same words of, from, from Hugo Chavez or Maduro's and Fidel Castro and, and Lula. So it's kind of like anti-United States. They see America as a colonizer. Is that what it is? Yeah. They, it's, it's a, it's an old idea from the Soviet Union mm. that permeates the culture on the left in Brazil. 
So they're very much against the United States. So they want to oppose the United States a lot in any way they can. So Millet is now siding with the United States, but well, the, the previous uh, parentists, they hated America. Same thing in Brazil. Lula is, well, Bolsonaro was pro-America. Lula is very much an, anti-America. And the BRICS is just a way of hurting the United States. So mm -hmm. the BRICS is not really a thing. It's not really an, an institution. It's just a group of people that meet with the bank uh, that was that is funded by China. But the main thing about the BRICS is it is, it is a way of agreeing to not do trade, for example, in U.S. dollars. So the main goal of Lula now and Lula already signed 15 treaties with China since it took office, uh, probably more now. The, the reason why the BRICS can bring India and China on the same table, countries that have different interests, is that the only thing that everyone agrees, Russia, China, India, is that the power of the United States needs to be undermined. They believe in a more multipolar world. And Lula is becoming cozy, very cozy with China because... On top of everything, China brings a lot of money that's good for mm -hmm. corruption. Can you describe what that relationship is like between Lula and the Chinese? Are you seeing more infrastructure investment from China? Uh, you know, what are the things that are are happening to undermine the United States as well? So currently, Brazil is discussing. Well, first of all, China is already very influential in Brazil, and they've been able to become influential even under Bolsonaro's um, administration. They they won a lot of infrastructure uh, contracts. They, they're, have their influence on the media is unbelievable. They finance most of the Brazilian media groups. They have agreements with them. They own members of Congress with bribe. So the mayor of Rio, the city that I live right now, he, when he was the mayor before, and I actually worked with him in the past. He was a very smart guy. But when he left office, he became the chairman of BYD, which is a Chinese electric car manufacturing company, which is actually belongs to the China Communist Party, like most companies behind the scenes. And he was, now he's the mayor of Rio again. Mm -hmm. He was a lobbyist for BYD, and now he's the mayor of the most important, arguably, uh, city in Brazil. So, uh, they, they, their tentacles in Brazil are huge. But with Lula, Bolsonaro tried to create some barriers. The 5G the cell phone uh, contracts in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro tried to stop this. Not completely successful, but he tried to stop Huawei from, from uh, winning these mm -hmm. contracts. Uh, he, he was only partially successful because he ended up winning uh, a lot of it. And we all know Huawei is a facade for spying that the Chinese Communist Party uses to spy on people around the world. With Lula, they can do whatever they want now. The Chinese. The Chinese. They can do whatever they want. Lula sees China as uh, the alternative to the United States. To the point that for 150 years, the United States were the number one commercial party of Brazil. And then Lula, on his first term, during his first term, China became number one. And now China does almost twice as, as much commerce with Brazil. And a lot of that is because of the incompetence of the Department of State. Because think about it. What's geopolitics? So Clausewitz used to say the politics is, uh, the, the, the war is politics. It's the continuation of politics, right? That's what he used to say, the Prussian general. And geopolitics is pretty much you preparing for a global war. Mm -hmm. And what do you need in a war? You need people, people to fight the war. You need food for these people. You need iron for the war machines. And you need energy. So Brazil is the sixth largest population in the world. Brazil is the fourth largest food producer in the world. Brazil is the number two iron ore producer in the world. And Brazil produces more energy than most OPEP countries and dominates nuclear energy technology. The Chinese understand that, the importance of, of Brazil from a geopolitical perspective. The Americans don't see they do. Do you think Americans are retreating from having a stronger relationship with Brazil? Is there something that you think the U.S could do or should be doing in order to strengthen that important relationship? Of course, there's uh, Brazil is culturally 
the, one of the closest countries to the United States, we all share the same values in general. We all share the same culture. In a weird world, um, where all the cultures are different from America right now, the Chinese is completely different. Indians, very different. Uh, Middle Easterns, very different. The Africans are very, Brazil is, we watch the same movies. Mm. And that's how America was always the good guys in the movies, right? Back before Hollywood <laughs> turned crazy. Uh, <laughs> but culturally, Christians, we have a presidential system that's very much copied from the United States. So we're, we're and the U.S. can have everything. So in this, this coupling process that the United States is doing with China, I think one lesson that the world learned is that doing commerce with China is not the same thing as doing commerce with uh, the United Kingdom or Brazil, people that share your values. It's not the same. And I think the United States could do a lot of more, a lot more with Brazil. Well, let's say you want your pharmaceutical companies to be in China or do you want them to be in Brazil? They could be in Brazil. We have the technology, we have the people and have all that. And I think once we have an administration in the United States that loves America, that want the best for the American interests, they should look at Brazil uh, as, a, uh, as a possible partner. And I hope Lula will be gone by then. Hmm. Two holes on both sides. That's part of the problem. What about Iran? Uh, what is Brazil's relationship with the Iranians and if the Iranians do come to the table, which they seem like they they are joining BRICS, and what does that look like? Are the Iranians having a strong influence on the Brazilians now? Well, we had the Iranian ship docking in Brazil uh, earlier in, in 2023 and Why? Being, being resupplied because Brazil let them, um, <laughs> the Brazilian government let them, and they even threw a party on the ship. It was the weirdest thing in the world. Uh, but also Brazil inviting uh, Iran. And that's that's all part of the anti-United States policy more than anything. Mm. Even the position against Israel is primarily a position against the United States. Mm. So the stronger guy, the, the most important guy on Lula's foreign policy, was, let me call it Lula's Anthony Blinken, mm. uh, he wrote the preface of a book uh, exhorting the political importance of Hamas. There's a gentleman called Celso Amorim. The political importance of Hamas. Yes. So Lula, it's, it's not new. The position of Lula anti-Israel is not new. So the, Lula's party was always openly against Israel and pro-Palestine, whatever that is. Hmm. And that's where Brazil stands now. The foreign policy of Lula's administration is a disaster. Most of his policies are. The economy is not doing well. Brazil in 2020 is expected to grow to grow um, two and a half to three uh, percent in in 2023, which you would say, "Wow, it's, it's good." No, no, it's because the agro business, which the crops and all the, the meat and all that produ production in Brazil, is going to grow 15 percent, and they represent 30 percent of the country's economy. But Lula is very hostile to the agribusiness in Brazil. So the rest of the countries, the manufacturing, the service, the construction, everything is going down the drain. What is your reaction to what is happening in Argentina right now? So you have a neighboring country that is pretty much taking the exact opposite on virtually every single thing that uh, President Lula is doing in Brazil. What do you know about Javier Malay and, and his intentions? Well, I think his intentions are great because the Argentinians had enough. I hope we don't reach that point because what we in Latin America, what we look at is that we look at Venezuela. And and that's a destination we don't want to reach. Disaster. It's a disaster. And we, every country, and people in Brazil say, we don't want to become another Venezuela. And so they know. They know. They know. Brazil had received, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of refugees from Venezuela. So we know. The problem is, and Argentina was going that way very fast. Mm -hmm. Right now, Argentina has 150% inflation. Right now, Argentina has roughly half of the population uh, under the poverty line. So they're starving, literally. <laughs> and with all that, it looked at one point that they're, they were going on the Venezuelan way. So we're all going towards Venezuela. Brazil's here. 
Argentina's here because Argentina was a great country yeah. before the left. They were very important. Now Argentina is almost irrelevant to the point that Argentina is one fourth of Brazilian economy. It's, the state of Sao Paulo is same size as Argentina in every possible way you can imagine. Mm -hmm. They're way less influential in South America. So the country was really in a bad trajectory towards Venezuela. And we look at that and we say, well, if they can do it, maybe we can change our route as well, our course, and maybe we can stop us from becoming a Venezuela. It was like a step. Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela. And, and the problem is that I think Millet is going to face a lot of resistance from the establishment. But the establishment is way stronger in Latin American countries than it is in the U.S. How are the Brazilians looking at Argentina right now? Are they saying, okay, this guy is crazy, uh, let him ruin Argentina? Or are they saying, mm, we kind of wish we had somebody like him saving us? I think we have both. I think the left, and, and don't get me wrong, there is, although I don't think Lula won the election fairly, I'm not sure there was fraud. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't fair and there was no transparency. Hmm. But you, I'm not part of the people that said, well, Lula had no votes. They frauded everything. I'm, I'm, I don't believe that. I don't believe that was the case. I do know that Lula has a lot of votes, a lot of lectures. Um, and I think they are not happy with Millet in Argentina. Hmm. But the majority of the country, slightly, is looking at Millet with hope and we're all curious as well to see what he can do. Right. Any final words of hope, uh, specifically when it comes to Brazil and this important relationship that Americans need to have with this massive country south of us? I think there are two important things. The first important thing is Americans need to start looking at Brazil because Brazil matters a lot. And I'm not saying that because I'm Brazilian. I'm saying that because I live in the United States. This is my country, the country of my two daughters. So if we want a safer world and where the Americans' interests uh, prevail, we need to take a co closer look at Brazil. If we don't, the Chinese will. Mm. This is the first thing. The second thing is look at us because we're not that different. In a sense that Anything that happened in Brazil can happen here. So what? Right now we have roughly six or five Supreme Conservative originalist Supreme Court justice. What would you think it would happen if the Democrats could pack the court? Or these guys are going away sometime. Mm -hmm. Do you think your court would be that different from us? Look at New York. Look at Alvin Bragg. Look at all the George Soros uh, prosecutors that you have around the country. So we're not that different. Your media is just as bad as ours. Your universities are gone. Hollywood beca became a place of madness. The Democratic Party is becoming completely radicalized. It's not moderate anymore. So, and the freedom of speech is still holding in this country, but not that much. By, by a thread. The, by a thread. By a thread. And if Americans go, if America goes down, <laughs> it's gone. Mm -hmm. I can't go anywhere. There's nowhere else to go. So yeah, that's, that's, that's why we that. have to fight. The First Amendment needs to be sacred in this country. We should never negotiate free speech because once free speech is gone, everything follows. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's why they're attacking free speech in Brazil. Yeah. More than anything. So you have the First Amendment. And if the First Amendment falls, all you have is the Second Amendment. And we don't want that. There is a movement within even the conservative right that is very focused on just America. You know, build that wall, sure. secure the borders, focus inward, you know, protect our Constitution. But don't get involved with other wars or other issues around the world. And I don't think we need to get into the issue of Israel and Ukraine and some of the, you know, actual wars that are happening right now. But when it comes to the topic of Brazil, for example, what is the risk that you see in isolationism? Because it seems like China is taking advantage of the narrative 
of isolationism. And they're kind of saying, well, if America wants to retreat and leave a vacuum, we'll happily step in and take over and, you know, do, do a little bribery and a little investments and, you know, really take advantage of us retreating. Can the United States survive with an isolationist mentality? I wish the two of us could even sit with somebody like Ronald Reagan and ask him about that because I think he had a vision for understanding what communism and Marxism is about, a vision that I think, sadly, we we have not been able to teach this next generation how important it is to pay attention to the world's arena and not just what is happening within our country. And just what are what are your remarks on it? Well, I, I, it's it's a problem that American conservatives faced since the beginning, right? The conservatives didn't want to get into mm. the World War II. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's good when you have two sides that are having a good discussion. So you can have liberals and conservatives mm. having a... The problem right now is that the left went nuts. So it, it's, there's no discussion anymore. Right. I mean, technically speaking, I believe most people on the left are out of their mind, crazy, meaning they lost contact with reality. So that's why the discussion is so hard. But on the point of the isolation is, America needs to take care of America first, no question about it. But you need friends. It's the same thing with your life. You need to take care of your life, right? You need to take care of your job and all that. But you never lose sight of two things. One is that you need friends because you can't be by yourself. And second is that you need to help people that are not, not in a good situation. And I think that's that's very present in the American culture. Americans mind their own business in the first place, but they try to have a social life and they help, they donate. They It's, it's a very charitable country. And I, I think the international policy of the United States should be the same way. And Ronald Reagan understood that a lot. And I say that because I remember the stories that my grandfather used to say about how Reagan helped him. Uh, and, and and that was greatly appreciated. What it's weird is that the lefts in America, they are smart. They're smart in the point that I think because of ide- ideological reasons, they actually have a network with countries in South America. They do meetings here in the U.S. George Soros funds most of the bad causes in Brazil. Same Bill Gates. If you look at it, if you look at what the Open Society donates, where they donate money in Brazil. Where? Well, to abortion, drugs, the same thing as in the U.S. Hmm. So uh, the left has a network. The right is so concerned with the problems within the country that they have zero. It's It's hard to even have members of Congress, of the United States Congress, listening to what's going on in Brazil. And trust me, I've been there in person, Mm. talking with members of Congress, trying to ask them, look, could you guys have hearings about this? It's not only that, your administration helped Lula to get in power, so you're responsible for the situation of my country. You helped it happening. It's not only that you didn't interfere. Mm -hmm. So, the left is very good at it, the right is not, and this is something we need to improve. The U.S. gives significant foreign aid to Brazil. It does. Do Brazilians know that? I mean, it, it, I'm sitting here as an American hearing that Brazilians um, are calling us imperialist and colonizers while we're sending them not millions of, of dollars. I mean, that's no, comes uh, across the, pretty the ungrateful. Leftists, yeah, the leftists do that. They, they, they hate America, and they will gladly take your money. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean they will like it. Mm-hmm. It's or us. I, I should say like us because I'm here. Right? Right. It's my country too. Right. Well, you know, the world is becoming a crazier place. But I appreciate sitting down with someone who can explain a little, a little bit of it to me. And uh, you know, we just need to keep fighting for freedom of speech. That's the most what it's about. Thing. Yeah. Uh, I think if America spreads uh, bad virus, places like this are the ones producing the cures. Yeah. Congratulations. Appreciate you saying that. Thank you.